So First Thessalonians chapter 5, I, I hope you've opened up to there uh, by now. I'm just going to read from verse 1 through to um, verse, verse 11. So this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica. He says, About the times and seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark, for this day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then, let us not sleep like the rest, but let us stay awake and be self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of, of the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So that, what, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. May God bless his word to us. So there's, um, there's no doubt to it that what we're experiencing in the world at the moment is just a massive, massive shaking up of things. Uh, if you think about it, um, things that were once, once stable are now, are now being shaken. Things that were immovable as far as we saw them are now suddenly being moved. Um, things that were once totally normal are no, are no longer the norm, um, like where we can go to the shops and, and going to work and, and catching up with a, with a group of friends and going and dining in a restaurant. Things that were so normal to us all of a sudden aren't normal anymore. Um, and things have changed rapidly in a very short amount of time. If I, if I just think about the last two weeks, it's, it's, I can't believe how quickly everything has, has progressed in such, such a short amount of time. Um, life just as we know and as we experience it is, is just been flipped um, upside down. Um, if you think about what people have experienced, people have, have, have lost their jobs or, or some people's wages have been uh, massively cut back. Uh, many people are feeling really uncertain about their futures. They, they, they just don't know what the future holds for them. Um, they, 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 they don't know how everything's going to work out. Uh, people who are living as though they, with the sense of immortality, as if they, they are, can't be broken, as if um, they can just do their work and make their money and, and gain popularity and success. And, and all of a sudden, they're confronted with this real, um, with, with the reality of the fact that they're not immortal, that they're actually very, very um, um, vulnerable. Um, and um, if you think about what many of us have experienced as well, that this has been just a forced time of, um, of slowdown. Um, the hustle and uh, bustle of life, just the, the busyness of it all. Um, for many of us that, that, that aren't able to work anymore, we've, we've lost all that hustle and bustle and we're, we're really forced to slow down. So we're going to pat this morning and ask me how his week was. He goes, yeah, I'm getting used to the, the rhythms of, what did you say, slowing down? Is that the rhythms of staying at home? Yeah, the rhythms, sorry, the rhythms of staying at home. Um, yeah, so stuff has just changed so much. So as I said before, there's no doubt about it that this is, just like a time of shaking for the, for the entire world. And when I, when I think about this, what it really makes me think of is, is the story that Jesus tells um, about the man that goes and builds his house upon the rock and the man that goes and builds his house upon the sand. Um, and he says that there is, there, there is two types of people. The one builds his house upon the rock, one builds his house upon the sand. Um, and that's a symbol of the fact that one person that builds his house upon the, the word of God and not just the word of God, but he's actually obeying God. And the other person who, even though he hears the word of God, he might know the word of God, he's not obeying God. And that's like building your house upon, upon the sand. But then Jesus says, these um, winds came and these waves came and the rains came and, and it beat upon the men's houses. And the man that had built upon the solid rock, he actually stood firm. But the man that had built upon the sand, his, his house got violently shaken and actually crashed to pieces upon the ground. I think for many people, all of a sudden, their lives are being tested just like this. It's exactly what Jesus warned about. So there would be these times when it would be like waves and winds and rains crashing upon your life, um, crashing upon everything you thought was normal, um, crashing upon your, your um, finances and your work and your stability. And um, for some people in that, in that moment, their, their, their lives actually come crashing down to pieces because they weren't built upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Now, but by that, I'm not meaning that you're necessarily going to have your work protected, necessarily going to have your finances protected, or necessarily going to have your health protected if you just obey Jesus. But I'm saying the people them, them, themselves, who they are, and their own souls, and their own hearts, and their minds, 
When they come into these times of testings and these times of shakings, everything falls to pieces because they weren't actually built upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Um, and we see this happening all around the world at the moment. Now, over, over, over the last couple of weeks, Pat and I have been sharing some of the things that we feel like God's putting on our heart for, for what God um, wants um, to be doing in, the, in his church during this, during this time. We've shared some things, like we said, we really believe that God is actually giving his church an opportunity to be like a, a shining light in the season in the midst of the darkness for us to really be the salt and really be the, the light of the earth. We also believe that, that God is inviting us into a place of prayer. We've, we've shared how we believe that God is calling us to actually seek him and to intercede and to pray and as Christians to stand upon the authority that he has given us. But not just in addressing the coronavirus, but also to get to know him more. Um, and we've, we've shared that we believe that God's still teaching us what it really means to love and what it really means to be a servant and what it means to be selfless. But today I want to just add something else that I really believe that I think God is actually doing in his church in this, in this, in this season. And that is that I believe God is actually calling us as the church to, to hit the reset button. That this is an opportunity for all of us to go to that big red reset button and to hit it and to just reboot and recalibrate and refresh this whole thing so that we can live our lives and do church the way that God wants to do it. Now, I'm not a, 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 tech, man, a, um, a um, tech head by, by any means. Um, I, 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 I'm not very good at all when it comes to laptops and, and phones and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, even just setting up all this um, things for, for online streaming has been a massive learning curve for me. Um, but if you think about it, like one, one um, trick that I'm sure we all know when it, when, it, when it comes to technology is if your laptop or your phone or your device, or whatever, is not working out the way that it should be working, it's somehow malfunctioning, um, it's, it's maybe got, it's been frozen or whatever. We all know that there's one trick that most of the time actually does the job. And that's just to restart the thing. Um, it's to hit the off button, turn it off, and then turn it back on again. And when we, when we do that, the thing reboots, it refreshes, it recalibrates. And then the issue that was there gets removed. And um, it starts functioning again the way that it's supposed to function. And that's exactly what I think God's actually calling the church to. He's in, he's asking us or he's inviting us to hit the reset button in the season so that we can remove the things in our lives and in the church that should not be there. And so that we can start functioning the way that God actually intended for us to function. Um, now, if you think about a, a reset, I'm sure that we've all experienced resets in our, in our, in our lives. Um, a, a, a common reset for people is when they take a holiday, as an example. So you've just been working like crazy. You've uh, booked yourself a, a, a time away in the city or, or at, the, or at the, um, the Gold Coast or maybe overseas somewhere. And you're just going to spend some time just resting. Uh, maybe you're going to go eat out more than normal. You're going to go and um, maybe spend some more time with your wife and with your, with your kid. You're going to take a book with you and you're just going to spend some time reading that, that, that book or maybe you're going to spend all day surfing, whatever it is. I'm sure we've all experienced resets like that where you've just been working like crazy. You seem like you've lost perspective and all the busyness of everything. And then you go away on this break and suddenly everything recalibrates and you can see where maybe you've been failing as a parent, where you've been failing as a spouse where you've lost your um, sight of the kingdom. God uses that time like that. I had a, I had a season like that, or um, two weeks like that, that were just massive in my life. Um, it was, um, we had lost um, two um, elders in our, in our leadership um, back in 2018, I think it was. Um, I hope that's right. That's the year, 2018. Um, and um, it was just a really, really difficult time. Things were a bit un un unsettled in church. People were, were really disrupted by everything that was going on. Um, and um, I went away to America for two weeks and I went and visited the International House of Prayer and spent a couple of days there and then went to the upper room and spent a couple of days in prayer there. And I had this crazy, refreshing experience where I felt like God just gave me perspective once again. Now, I, I'm sure you've experienced things like that as well. But when you actually look at the story of God's people, um, when, you, when, you, when you look at the storyline all throughout the word of God, you see that time and time again, God actually invites his people into these moments of reset. Um, you, you see it particularly in the life of Israel. 
where God's made this covenant with the special people of Israel. They are his nation. He's given them specific laws and specific promises, and, but also warnings of judgment if they disobey and they're not faithful to the covenant. And then Israel do well for a particular season, but then they get distracted and they um, lose their focus and they, 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 they go after other gods and they start getting involved in uh, prostitution and they, they, they forget about the laws that God has asked them to keep. And then you see that God raises up people to call his church back to a reset. And you see these um, often described as solemn assemblies where the people gather together before God and they, they open up the word again and they, they, they read the word together and then they, they meditate upon it and they pray and they repent and they ask the Lord for forgiveness that times of refreshing would, um, um, and would, would um, come from the um, hands of God so that the people could be renewed. It happens time and time again throughout the story of Israel. And I think God's actually doing the exact same thing with his church at this very moment, calling us to a reset just like that. We humble ourselves before him. We get our perspective right once again. And we look to him for times of refreshing to come from his hands. Um, now, this is important for us as, as individual followers first, and then we'll talk about the church. As individual followers, this is so important because you know, just as well as I do, that life is crazy busy that we have so much communication that we have to interact with between emails and messengers. There is social media that is bombarding us from, from every angle. Um, we've got pressures in family life. We've got pressures at work. We've got um, pressures with, um, with projects that we've got on our hands, all sorts of things that are able to weigh us down and to distract us. And so as we look to reset and to get our focus right, there are some really important questions we have to ask ourselves. Some of those questions are, um, what values of mine need to be realigned? We need to ask what habits of mine need to be reformed? What dreams of mine need to be refreshed? What patterns of thinking need to be renewed? What behaviors need to be repented of? Ultimately, what things in my life do I need to hit the reset button on? So, um, for many of us, we're in desperate need of this because we have been distracted. We have tolerated sin. We've begun to chase after money and, and earthly things instead of seeking first the kingdom of God. We've been lazy instead of being self-controlled. We've been hoarding instead of being selfless and giving. And we've neglected our family on the altar of building our, our careers or, or a, 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 um, accomplishing something, maybe in studies or, or in popularity. Who knows? Um, we've allowed the fire of our love to go out for Jesus to become dull or we've allowed busyness to steal our rest. These are just some of the things that I'm sure many of you have experienced. And it's so important that you ask yourself some of these hard questions so that you can properly reset. But it's not only for us as, as um, individuals, but it's also for us as, as the church. And I don't just speak about Grace House, just the, the, the um, church in Logan. I think globally, um, given the scale of what is taking place in the face of the earth, this very moment, I think globally God is actually calling his church to a reset. And there are some hard things that the, that the, that the church of God needs to ask itself. Um, questions like, are we doing church the way that we, we ought to do church? If you think about how we do church with three songs and a 40-minute sermon and, and people just showing up on a Sunday for an, for an hour and a half to participate in this Sunday experience, um, is this really what God wants church to look like? Um, um, these are important questions. We have to ask the questions, what practices do we have as a church that need to be reformed? So is, are there things that we're doing that have become impure? Is the, is the way that we're preaching the word, has that become impure? Has our, has our worship become tainted with self instead of be, being properly focused on God? Have we decided to be more concerned with events than we've been concerned with actually feeding the poor and um, helping the needy? So what of our practices need to be reformed? Um, questions such as, if Jesus returned today, would he be pleased by how we've structured our ministries, how we run our services, how we love one another, how we reach the lost, how we serve the least of these? Are our values and priorities in the order that they're supposed to be? Do we really believe that we're seeking first the kingdom of God? And ultimately, what things are there in the church that we are in desperate need of hitting the reset button on? And I think in this season, what God wants is to change so much about the heart of his church and how we operate. Um, so here are some things I think he wants to do. I think he wants to replace um, moral compromise and indifference that we've become so accustomed to, moral compromise and indifference with a radical righteousness, with a really radical holiness 
that actually puts Jesus on display. And when people look at our lives as the church, it is blatantly obvious that we are totally different. I also think that he wants to replace people treating the Bible like a, like a, like a fortune cookie. It's just something that we go to at a particular moment to find nice verses that make us feel good. I think he wants to turn that upside down and bring people back to a deep commitment to his word where people meditate upon his word and they feast upon his word and they allow the word like a two-edged sword to cut them to pieces and to expose the thoughts and the intentions of their hearts. I think God wants to replace our, our pursuit as churches um, where, 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 where we've, we've pursued fame, and we've pursued status, and we've pursued popularity for ourselves to build a name for, for, for our church, whether it's, whether it's Grace House or, or, our, de, or our denomination or whatever it is. Where people have pursued these things, God, I think God wants to, to turn this around and give people a focus once again on, on discipleship and actually just putting aside the names and the titles and then people living in community with one another where they just want to edify one another, just want to build one another up and, and meet one another's needs. I think that God wants to replace just um, the attendance of church services and the attendance of conferences and events with genuine community. I think he wants to um, replace where we've just been so accustomed to just living things, um, taking things easy and protecting ourselves where he's going to make us ready to suffer for the name of Jesus, to actually count it as a blessing and as a joy to be persecuted for the sake of Jesus Christ. And I think he's going to take our, um, our, um, our entertainment driven way of doing church, how we're so reliant upon entertainment. And I think he's going to turn that around and restore to his church fervent prayer and regular fasting. These are just some of the things that I genuinely believe God is doing in his church at the moment. I actually had a really interesting dream. I think it's about a week ago now, just, just over a week ago, where I genuinely believe God, God spoke to me about this. And what happened in the dream is I um, went to McDonald's and um, went to McDonald's and I, and I really wanted to have a salad at, at McDonald's. Um, and as I, um, I was telling the, um, the waitress um, that I, I, I uh, or the person that was serving us, I want the salad. They, they, they came and offered me two Big Macs instead, totally for free. And um, in the dream, I say, yep, yeah, okay, great. I'll um, take the Big Macs because why, why would you not take two Big Macs, if, especially if they're free? Um, and um, I um, eat those Big Macs. And in the dream, I instantly start feeling so sick. Um, my, my stomach's just churning and everything just feels off. And I knew that was such a bad decision. And then my dream switches and I go to... Um, I am I'm suddenly in a, a massive church, a really, really big church building, and it's packed with people. And I'm really aware that it's coronavirus time. So I'm like, why are all these people here in this church when it's coronavirus time? We shouldn't all be here in this church. But I go and find myself a seat towards the back of the auditorium. And um, I'm watching the whole church service unfold. I'm watching the people on the stage as a full band and worship is going, but nothing is working. Um, everything is sounding terrible. The musicians are playing out of time with one another. Um, everything is just clumsy up on the stage. And it's just so obvious to everyone that the service isn't working. And then suddenly I see this character show up in the midst of the congregation. Um, and he looks just like Bono from U2. And, um, and he's got this really fancy jacket on that's all, that's all glittery and um, shiny. He's got a microphone in his hand. He's dancing around amongst the people singing and obviously drawing attention to himself. And he makes his way up on the stage and he's dancing and he's singing up on the stage. He finishes his song and he starts making his way off the stage. And as he does, he actually trips and falls over and really badly hurts himself. Um, and I'm watching this whole thing unfold. And then suddenly I see church leadership from that church. I'm, I'm get on there, um, um, like, get down on the ground and they start commando crawling over to where Bono is lying on the ground and they grab him by the shirt and they try to drag him off to the side, hoping that no one will see them dragging the person off, off to the side. And um, I, when I woke up from the, the, the um, dream, I, I woke up instantly knowing what, what, what this dream meant. And there was one part that Pat helped me to make, to make sense of, but I think this is what, what, what God was speaking to me. He was saying that um, we like the church um, have become so, um, fixated on performance. Um, we've, 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 we've turned church into a, into a performance and how the music is done and how the preaching is done and, and, um, and um, how we um, meet with one another. It's all so gravitating towards performance because people are, are hungry for entertainment. They want to be entertained. They want to be entertained. And so as the church, we started catering to that. But what's happening is that in this coronavirus time, 
um, God is going to actually bring all of that down. He's actually going to cause it to fall. So in the dream where this Bono person that represents this performance way of doing church, where he falls over, I think that means that God's actually going to bring about the collapse of this performance mentality within his, within his church. But I think many people in our lead, um, church leaders aren't going to be happy about it. And just like what I saw in my dream, they try to crawl over and grab grab um, um, Bono and drag him off so that no one can notice. I think there are going to be leaders that try and do exactly that. They're going to try and resist what God's doing and do things the way that we had, have been doing it for so long. Um, and I think the whole McDonald's part of it was that, yeah, we have been, it's as though the church has, um, in, in, um, has been in need of salad for food, but we have foolishly gone to the fast food place. We've um, gone to the place that just gives you a quick and easy meal um, that's going to taste good, but it's not actually good for you. We've gone and sought food there. And that's that performance way of doing church. Um, um, and in feasting upon it, even though it's been free and it's been so easy, it has actually made us sick. And so I really believe that, that God is going to be changing this within his church during the season. And when we actually come out of the season, not just Grace House, but the church in Australia and across the world is actually going to look very different because God's going to use the season to teach us some really important lessons and to strip us of things that aren't pleasing in his sight. But yeah, so what does all of this have to do with first Thessalonians? Um, well, I, I wanted to take us to first Thessalonians because I think it fits in with what I'm talking about when it comes to resetting. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just read verses one to verse three, and then let's, then let's un, unpack a little bit. Verse 1 to verse 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. About the times and seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I preached a sermon on um, revival purity. And when God really moves in his spirit, yes, there's signs and wonders. And yes, there's masses of people getting saved. And yes, the, the, the kingdom of God moves rapidly. All those things are so exciting. But one of the big things that God does in, in revival is he actually purifies his church. Um, and in that, that, that sermon, I was saying that I think what is so desperate and what, what God is doing is that he's teaching us, as, or in, in, in revival, he will teach us to live in light of the judgment seat. He will cause us to fix our eyes on the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back really soon and he's coming back for a pure bride he's not coming back for a a, um, a bride that is that is um, sleeping around with foreign lovers and he's not coming back for a, a bride that has um a gone and defiled herself with the things of the world he's coming back for a pure bride jesus is cleansing his bride now the time for judgment has begun and that judgment is cleansing the church of jesus and so in revival god does that in incredible ways and so I think what is happening is even during this season already, even as we, in, in this coronavirus season, there is a form of reviving already taking place in the, in the church. And what is happening is that God is teaching his people to live their lives and to do church in view of the day of the Lord, in view of the judgment seat, in view of the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back soon and they need to get their lives clean and they need to be right with him. So here, verse one, um, Paul says to the Thessalonians, he says, verse two, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Now, what is the day of the Lord? Well, the day of the Lord is the day when Jesus comes back and all things will be judged. Now, for the, for the, for the rebellious person, this day is the day um, that will mean eternal destruction, where they have refused to bow the knee to Jesus. They refuse to call upon him as Lord. They have continued to live their lives in sin um, and um, and at that moment, Jesus Christ will, 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 will judge them for what they have done. And he will remove them from the face of the earth um, and, and send them off to eternal destruction. And for the Christian, this day means two things. The first thing that this day means for the Christian is that it'll be the day where our works are tested. And everything will be weighed up in the balance. And God will see, um, he, will, he will reveal whether we have been faithful or not. He will, he will test everything about us. And it will be made abundantly clear whether we love the way that Jesus loved, whether we, we serve God with a genuine heart, whether we actually sought first the kingdom of not, uh, um, the um, kingdom or not. And then in that moment, God will assign to each of us a reward according to our faithfulness. Um, so that's the first thing that it means for us, the Christian. But the second thing it means for us is that that day will be the day when the new creation begins in all of its glory, in all of its fullness. 
and all sickness and suffering and death will be totally removed. Now, what does COVID-19 have to do with the, with the, with the day of the Lord? Now, you might have heard some people on, on Facebook saying that, oh, this is definitely the end times. This is, this is guaranteed that Jesus is coming back in our generation jesus christ prophet uh, um, uh, we, are, we are we are told in god's word that in the end times there will be earthquakes and and the rumors of wars and the spreading of plagues and so um of course this is what this is what we're in now i'm not one of those people that that's going to start claiming things like that um i'm it, in some ways it fits the bill yes the bible does say that there'll be spreading of plagues and yeah there is a great plague spreading across the face of the earth so maybe but to be honest with you i don't i don't know but what I think God does want for us, um, even though we don't know whether, whether this is the end time or not, or whether this is the generation when Jesus is going to come back, it's exactly moments like this. When we do experience um, a, a, fam, uh, a, um, a plague like this, or in other situations, when we do experience war, when we do see famines, or, or when, we, when, when we do hear of great natural disasters, where God wants us to hit the reset button, where he wants us to look at our own lives and go, wow, in light of everything that's coming, that's taking place at the moment, and in view of what the Word of God tells me about what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back, I need to think about my life and make sure that I'm actually ready for the day when Jesus Christ returns. Now, this is what Paul's getting at here in this in, the, in this in this passage, and he's he wants the church to be ready, so, um, um, and he um, wants the non-Christian to be to be to be ready. So the non-Christian needs to repent to get right with Jesus. And the church needs to purify herself and make sure that she's fully alive and awake. So he says here, the, the first image that he gives us, he says that this day when Jesus Christ returns will be like a thief coming in the, in the middle of the night. And um, um, so what does that mean, that Jesus will come like a thief in the middle of the night? Well, it means at least two things. It means that it will be sudden and it will be unexpected. So Jesus says the same thing in, in, in Matthew 24, verse, verse 42 to verse 44. He says, therefore, be alert. So since you don't know what day your Lord is coming, but know this, if the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, he would have stayed alert and not let his house be broken into. This is why you are, you are also to be ready because the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, recently, I think it was um, last year sometime, um, the back end of last year, um, just at the Hyperdome, uh, there was a um, car that, um, that um, drove through a um, window at the Hyperdome and drove into the Hyperdome and went and drove through the glass at the Proud's um, jewelry shop. And they stole thousands of dollars worth of, worth of jewel, um, jewelry. They got away with it and then actually went and burnt their car in Shaler Park. Um, now, you think about that. These thieves that came in the middle of the night, I think they came like 2 a.m. or something like that. If the Hyperdome had known that the thieves were going to come at that exact moment. I'm certain they would have put um, more security guards on, or maybe they would have called the, the um, cops. They would have made some sort of preparation in order to brace themselves for the fact that they knew that there was going to be an attempted robbery at that moment. Now, Jesus is saying that since we don't know the moment he's going to return, and Paul is saying the same thing, we don't know the moment Jesus is going to return because he's coming like a thief in the night. It's going to be sudden and unexpected. Therefore, what we have to do is always be ready. We have to always keep our eyes on Jesus. We have to always seek first the kingdom of God. We have to always make sure that we're not tolerating even a single little bit of sin in our lives. We as the church have to always make sure that we're doing church the way that Jesus wants us to do church. We can't afford to spend time and to spend effort and to spend resources not doing church the way that Jesus wants church to be done. If he's coming back at a sudden and unexpected way, we have to get prepared now. So that's the first thing he says. He says it'll be like a thief in the night. And then he says that it'll be like the labor pains of a, of a pregnant woman. Now for husbands that have been there and witnessed their wives suddenly experiencing labor pains, I think the wives are probably thinking, what are you talking about? I experienced the labor pains. And that's, and that's, and that's absolutely true. But you, you guys, for, for husbands that have witnessed it, for wives that have actually experienced it, that these labor pains, when they, when they came on, you know that they were inescapable. So the thief of the night tells us that it'll be sudden, unexpected, but the labor pains of a pregnant woman tells us that it'll be inescapable. And you know, when those, when those, when those pains start um, coming on, the only option that, that the woman has in that moment is to get that baby out, is to, is to push through the process of, of, of labor because you're not going to be able to escape from the pain that you're experiencing. But Paul says here that 
Many people will be going around saying, peace and security, peace and security. And then suddenly Jesus Christ will return. And then the pains of judgment will actually begin. For the non-Christian, they'll be faced with the fact of an eternity separated from God. And for us as Christians, there will be a pain for us, of course, in having to see things that we did and sins that we didn't repent of and ways that we didn't please God because we were apathetic and we were indifferent and we were distracted. There will be very real things for us to experience. But in this section, Paul's specifically focusing on the non-Christian. And this um, peace and security that he's talking about is he's referring to um, a, um, um, this, is, oh, this is a reference to Roman propaganda. Um, you might have heard of the Pax Romana, to the, um, uh, um, of the Roman peace. This um, it was something that they would inscribe on, on their um, coins and they would inscribe it um, on the official inscriptions and, and monuments. And it would promote this idea of um, peace and attach that was security because of the greatness of Rome. Um, and so here are all these people putting their confidence in a political system or putting their confidence in an, in an empire or in a society or in a culture that we have the society of peace and we have the society of security. And does that not sound like the West? Like, does that not sound like Australia or like, or like America or the way that we think as countries? It's, it's peace and security. It's so good. It's so easy. Life is so stable. It's so straightforward. We can make our money. We can earn our living. Everything is so nice for us and set up for us. And we've got a government that takes care of us and we have Medicare. All these things set up for us. It's peace and security. And Paul says that people will be talking like this. And then suddenly Jesus Christ will return. And the, 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 the pains of labor will come upon people and it'll be inescapable. And so what should we do? We have to be ready. We have to at all times be prepared before that moment. Now, God wants us at a moment like this, where COVID-19 has hit the nations of the world, is to remember that what we're experiencing now, COVID-19 has come quickly. So remember that the day of the Lord is going to come quickly. COVID-19 in many ways has been inescapable for people. But the day of the Lord even more so will be inescapable. And so, are we ready? Are we ready for that moment when Jesus Christ will return? Now, Jonathan Edwards, he was a um, great theologian in the um, 1700s in America and played a massive role actually in um, revivals that, that swept through America in the Great Awakening. Now, some of you might have read his um, resolutions before, but he's got two resolutions on this exact point that I think are so pertinent. Um, these are these life resolutions, and I think he wrote them when he was still in his teenagers, or most of them at least, and then he added to them as he went. And these, are the, the, these are the resolutions that he, that he wanted to live his entire life by. He wanted to um, govern everything that he did. So resolution number seven that he wrote, he said, resolved, Never to do anything which I would be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. You know, how much would it change the way that we live? If we evaluated everything that we do by would I be okay doing this, knowing this could be the last hour of my life. Now, what I'm not saying is that if you do that, you need to just entirely lose perspective and, um, and um, just right now go and, um, yeah, go and, and spend time with your wife sobbing or something like that. Oh, the end's coming or, or that you have to go out now for the last hour of your life and just evangelize. Um, but I'm talking about the state of your heart. I'm talking about the habits that you know have been in place this whole time. I'm talking about the things that you know you're, 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 you're focused on. When Jesus Christ comes back and the core of who you are, the core of who you focus on, the state of your heart, would you be happy knowing that those things are there? If... Jesus will be here and right in front of you in 60 minutes. Then he also said in resolution number 19, resolve never to do anything which I would be afraid to do if I expected that it would not be above an hour before I should hear the last trump. Basically saying the same thing. So what do we need to do? We need to see to it that we are always ready, always walking in purity. And so let's move on. Let's let go on with what, um, with what, um, we read here in the, in the passage, um, verse 4 and verse 7. So chapter 5, verse 4, verse 7. So, but you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark for this day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. 
We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then let us not sleep like the rest, but let us stay awake and be self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. So what, is, what should we want for ourselves as the church? Well, he says that we should be, verse, verse 6, let us stay awake and let us be self-controlled. That's what the CSB says. But most of your translations, if you're not reading the CSB, it's going to say sober. Let us be awake and let us be, let us be sober. You think about a person that's fast asleep, fast asleep. Um, if you sleep the way that I sleep, um, you don't have much of an idea of what's going on around you. Um, I don't know if Pat sleeps like that as well. I, I imagine that, that you would. You seem like a good sleeper. Um, not that I've observed you sleep. But um, uh, um, yeah, I, I, it's one of Jesse's great frustrations is that um, when, it, when, it, when it comes to babies, um, yeah, if I decide that I'm, I'm, I'm going to sleep tonight, and I'll just most of the time sleep through the baby's crying or, or if she hears a, a noise in the house or something like that, Jesse will be up and she'll have to like give me a couple of shoves and pushes or something like that and try to wake me up. Uh, but you see if a person that's, that's, that's asleep, they're not, they're not to it. They're not, they're not present with what's going on. They're not ready to appropriately respond. And, and of course that's the exact same with a um, drunken person. If you've seen a person that is, that is, that is, that is drunk, that is, that is not sober and you've tried to have a meaningful conversation with them, you know it is absolutely futile. It is one of the most frustrating things, going down to schoolies and evangelizing during schoolies with all these drunk teenagers and you're trying to share the gospel with them. And the amount of times you go back and forth and you answer the same question, they ask you over and over again, so who are you? What are you, what are you doing here? Oh, Jesus, yeah, I love Jesus. Like that. When, you're, when, you're, when you're drunk, when you're not sober, you don't have the ability to act reasonably and to do what is right. And so Paul's saying, church, we are the people who are the children of light. So God's done this incredible work in our lives. We don't belong to the dark anymore. We belong to the light. And so because we have had the shift inside of us, we are a pe- as a people should not be caught up off guard by Jesus Christ's return, but we should be ready for that moment when he comes like a thief in the night. Be like a person that is fully awake, that is present, and be like a person that is sober, that you're able to, to do what is reasonable. Um, and I heard this story as I was preparing for this, for, for this message that I really wanted to share. It was about this hotel in Chicago. And, um, and um, um, it was, I think it was like three or four decades ago, the queen was going to go and visit. Um, I just said this town in Chicago. It was about uh, a hotel, I think. Did I say town? I don't know. It was about this hotel in Chicago. And the um, queen was going to come and visit Chicago. And, um, and um, everyone was, was, was making pref, um, preparations for her arrival. So I mean, she was coming in on a um, boat and um, they were going to have this red carpet rolled out for her. And apparently they, they had painted all these walls within the city for her and, and put up all these decorations and put out flowers. And, and then there was this one hotel that was contacted and they were actually um, asked if they could make preparations for the queen to come and stay at their hotel. Um, and the hotel responded by saying, we don't need to make preparations because we are always prepared for royalty. Um, and I thought that story is just a perfect summary of what Jesus Christ wants for us. We should be a people that don't need to make preparations for royalty, that need to make preparations for Jesus Christ's return because we are always prepared for Jesus Christ's return. We have always got everything in order. We've always got everything in line. We've always got our eyes fixed on him and the author, the perfecter of our faith. We are always making sure that we're in step with his will for our lives. And so what does God want for us? He wants us to be a people who are awake and who are sober. Now, here are some specific things that I think as we wake up and as we reset that God's going to do even in our church. Number one, I think he's going to sharpen our focus on Jesus. We're going to get back to the place of delight in Jesus. Um, One of our visions for this year is the pursuing of God's presence through prayer and fasting. And at the heart of that is that we want to enjoy him. We want him to be our first love. We want him to be everything to us. We want to feast on the pleasures that are at his right hand forever. We want to be a people who are entirely lovesick. You think about... um, you think about the passion of a, of, a, of, a, of a married couple, the intimacy that they get to experience with, with one another, this, this, this intoxicating love. Now, the Bible is very clear 
that that intoxicating love that, that a, it's a, a man and a wife can experience with one another is a picture, it's a metaphor of the intoxicating love that needs to be shared between us and God, from our hearts towards him and from his hearts towards us. You see that in the Song of Solomon, this incredible picture of God that is like this lovesick, um, this lovesick lover that is, that is pursuing his bride and the bride that is just responding to the pursuit of her lover's love. And um, that's what God wants. And he wants to bring us back to that place where we sharpen our focus. And Paul warns, he says, my fear for you, and um, when he writes to the Corinthians, is that, that Satan will come and he would, he would pull you away. He would distract you from a sincere and pure devotion to Jesus, just like he did with Eve in the garden. Also think he wants to sharpen our focus on purity, like I've already mentioned. For us to get serious about walking in holiness, to have a no tolerance attitude when it comes to sin, to humble ourselves before God and to mourn and to weep when we need to mourn and weep so that he can exalt us and lift us back on our feet again. Third is I think it was to sharpen our focus on the mission, get back to the place of hurting over souls that don't know Jesus. He wants to sharpen our focus on the value of the kingdom. And on this point particularly, I think, where we've so been caught up in hurrying and striving and trying to do ministry and, and, and striving in our workplace and, and, and um, just continually communicating and being busy and busy and busy and busy and busy and busy. There are some real kingdom values that he's going to restore to his church, like stewardship. Kingdom values like, like patience. Kingdom values like friendship and family, where these things are enjoyed and they're celebrated and they are prioritized above the busyness and the rush and the craziness of everything that we experience in society. I have already experienced this even just in this week. I didn't even realize that I, that I, I needed to sharpen my focus on God's kingdom values. Um, yeah, even just Monday, starting down, I'm um, starting in um, just being at, at, at home. And we got, got to about halfway through the day. And um, I suddenly felt like I caught breath again. And I didn't even know why because I didn't realize that I was puffed out but just slowing down that little bit and being with the kids and being with my wife and um and um just changing that pace suddenly I realized oh my goodness I did it again I fell for the trap of busyness and I actually in doing so stopped enjoying Jesus the way that I that I ought to have been and I and I lost focus of the, the countless good gifts that God has surrounded my life with that he wants me to enjoy I think God's going to be using this season to really um, sharpen our focus on some of those things. So let's just finish reading here, verse 8 to verse 11. He says, But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the, the armor of faith and love and the helmet of the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So that whether we are awake or asleep, so that's talking about people that are still alive, people that have died, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you're already doing. So Paul gives there some very specific applications for things that people need to change in their lives and focus their lives on as they live as people that are really awake. Um, but if you read some of the other passages in Romans 13, he gives different points of application. Um, and, and other passages where he, where in like Revelation, for example, where the church is commanded to wake up, God gives different application. But you see at the heart of it, at the, at the heart of all these passages, there is this, there is this, common denominator and that is that God is calling his church when he's asked them to wake up is to reset and to get focused on what really matters so I want to put it to you this um, morning that God is doing this in the season I genuinely believe it I've already experienced it I've heard others testify to it um, and I want to put it to you this morning and say that God is inviting you to reset he's inviting you to hit that button and to refresh, and to reboot, and to recalibrate, and to make sure that your priorities are in order, that you are focused on Jesus Christ, that you are seeking first his kingdom, and that you have a no tolerance attitude towards sin, so much so that Jesus Christ could return this very moment, and you would be absolutely ready and excited for that moment, instead of someone that feels like they still have something to hide or something that has not been properly dealt with. So that's for you personally. And then also for us as a church, I want to ask you to please pray. I want to ask you to, to plead with God to, 
to teach us as a church how he wants us to reset. I am personally, I know for Pat as well, that we do not want to be doing church in a way that is not the way that Jesus Christ intended for church to be done. We want to preach the word the way that he wants the word to be preached. We want discipleship to be prioritized the way that he wants discipleship to be prioritized. We want community to take precedent, precedence over events and over performance. We want um, the kingdom to matter more and the broader church body to matter more than us just making a name for ourselves. And we're sure there are more things that we're not even aware of yet that God is saying, I need you to reset on this and to recalibrate and to get your focus right as a church. So I want to invite you, however long the season lasts that we're in, whether it's going to be another three months or another six months or another year, as God gives us an opportunity to slow down and to get away from the distraction, press into him for the sake of your own life and press into him for the sake of our church and ask him to renew things and to do in our midst what he needs to do. Who knows? But this might actually be this revival that we've been anticipating. What God is actually going to do in the midst of a situation like this. Or maybe this is going to be the moment when he prepares us for a great outpouring of his spirit that, 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 that's going to come after all of this. And this whole season was like preparing the way of the Lord so that Jesus could come riding in on his glory. So please um, receive these words as, 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 as good soil. Don't go from here today and let Satan snatch it up or let the things of this world choke it out. Let the sun scorch it and burn it up. Receive it like a good soil. Let it go down deep in your heart. And even this very day, go and spend time in prayer. Even this week, make sure that you're pressing in and ask God to reset your life. And I'm sure you'll see him do some really exciting things.